This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. The Norris Group proudly presents our 14th annual award-winning event, I Survived Real Estate. Industry experts join Bruce and Aaron Norris to discuss evolving industry trends, real estate bubbles, inflation, and opportunities emerging for real estate professionals. All proceeds from the event benefit Make-A-Wish and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris. Today, our special guest is Derek Harms. Derek is the president of NSDREI. Derek brings a multifaceted real estate skill set to the organization. As a realtor, he's a leader in the San Diego market with Compass Realty. His savvy negotiations and innovative market strategies join uncompromising integrity as the emblem of Derek's service. Having over 10 years of experience and a young and fresh perspective on real estate world helped Derek stay ahead of the technology curve, employing the most cutting edge marketing tools and techniques available he has consistently reached the most eyes possible with eye-popping material. Derek, being an active investor himself, can view the market from an analytical perspective to ultimately solidify his client's bottom line. Real estate investment is more than an income stream for Derek, it's a lifestyle. He is an active residential redevelopment specialist in many different San Diego neighborhoods, adding to his successful single family home flipping business in Southern California. Derek owns numerous properties throughout the United States. So Derek, we welcome you to our show. Thank you, Bruce. Wow, what a long-winded uh, <laughs> bio that um, I, I feel like uh, I, I have definitely have a, a more tailored, cleaner, newer one, but uh, hey, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> well, was there, was there anything that wasn't true on there? <laughs> no, 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 de definitely not. I would say though, the biggest shift though, since that bio actually was out is that um, I, I've been focusing a lot more on the investment side of real estate over the past three or four years than I have on the brokerage side. Um, it's funny how they kind of go hand in hand and you can leverage one with the other. Um, and that's, that's always been the, the goal. It was uh, brokerage was always sort of a means to an end. Um, but that said, I still do it a lot and I still love it. Um, but, uh, you know, I think you would agree um, asset ownership is the key to wealth. And the more of taste of it that you get, the more involved you want to be. Well, what's interesting when you say that, first of all, I want to just touch on how did you get into real estate? First of all, because I mean, when did you graduate? What year were you graduating college? College was 2008. Okay. So, I mean, you're not 40 or you're close to it. Uh, I'm 35. Not even close to it. Okay. <laughs> well, the, the reason I, you, you know, I know you realize you're pretty unusual case because at 35, the amount of success you had is very unusual. Also to enter a business where like what percentage of realtors have five transactions a year? Uh, it's probably less than 5% of the whole pile of realtors. I would agree and you, Okay. And then you add the investment side of it on. And, you know, and I speak in re like realtors years ago, uh, I'm just, you know, I'd, I'd ask for a raise of hands. How many guys invest in real estate? And there would be no hands in 300 agents. who are just going, wow, it would, it would make it a little easier to sell if you bought into owning it, you know? It's true. And just a quick touch on that. I've talked to a lot of the, you know, the, the, the top producing agents in San Diego. And I'm always astonished um, when I asked that same question as to how many of them actually invest in real estate themselves. And, you know, some of them have pretty large portfolios and, um, you know, no way am I judging, but I feel like if, if you're in that position to take advantage of it is so, is so it's not that hard to do. It's an easy transition and you just got to, you know, shift the mindset a little bit. And I wish people would do more of it, but um, you know, it, it, it seems pretty consistent across the board. I hear those stories a lot. Yeah. And it's, it would so much easier to say, um, you should buy one of these because, you know, you're doing it yourself. And so that just makes it, as a salesperson, it, that's one of the first things I ask somebody and say, I'm buying a, I, I'm in Florida. So one of the things that's unusual now is I don't have any contacts. I have to recreate the wheel after doing business with the same people for 30 years. So if I go to a car dealer and I'm getting a test drive, 
I'm just curious what car, what kind of car do you drive? You know, and if it's not what I'm being being shown, you know, I'm out. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, so, totally. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I think uh, to, to all, all the agents defense too, though, it, there is a mindset that has to be shifted. And there's this like, I can't mentality, even if you do a lot of transactions, like, oh, hey, I, I can own this, I can make the numbers work, I can figure out how to create, create value. Um, I think there is that, that, that mindset component that I think is the struggle. And then once that happens, then it's like, um, you know, when they're just excited about it. And before you know it, they own 10 properties. <laughs> What came, what came first for you, the realtor side? No, actually, no. Uh, 2010, I bought a, uh, a duplex in Barstow um, for $22,500. <laughs> um, it was one of those Fannie Mae home path uh, properties. Remember that? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, uh, I made an offer. I, I, and I, 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 maybe I told you a story, maybe not. But I know Tony Alvarez knows this. He, he smiles every time I say this. I went to a Tony Alvarez class. Uh, back in 2010 and I started getting hit the phones right after it calling REO agents and um, I got a bunch of agents uh, hey man you sound like you just went to a seminar and this is a script and I said well it is and I'm like 22 <laughs> and I want to know how to do this so you know here, here's what it is and anyway I ended up buying uh, uh, duplex in Barstow 22.5 and I was a bartender at the time and I ended up flipping it for like 56,000 uh, bucks, sold it to a regular at my bar. Um, and so that was the catalyst for me to get going. And I just said, screw bartending. I'm going to give this real estate thing a shot. Well, interesting. You know, I always like to figure out how people went where they did. So the bartending, that's very personable, right? I mean, the more personable you are, the more you'll get tipped. Absolutely. And you have to have social skills and, you know, you get to learn uh, more about people. They'll tell you the bartender things and won't tell their family, you know, so uh, you start to get take the temperature of the room pretty quick. Okay. So you got this first taste of being an investor. Did Tony Alvarez continue to be your, you know, like your training mentor? Did you branch out? How did you deal with that? Yeah, I kind of uh, branched out a little bit from there. And you would think after that, I would just be satisfied with doing what I was doing there in California, but I, I didn't. Um, I went and took a tax lien certificate training and I forgot <laughs> the gentleman's name that that was like the guy who did that. Um, but I went and learned how to do that. And then I got interested in buying tax properties at tax deed sales in Florida. And I ended up buying one in Florida uh, all online. And it was, it was kind of a scary process. It was sight unseen. Uh, although I did have uh, some family in the area in Florida. So I was able to get some boots on the ground out there. Long story short, I bought a house at an auction. It was the worst house in the best neighborhood. Little did I know that there was over a hundred thousand dollars of uh, code enforcement violation liens on the property. The county, this house had been on the news. I didn't know about it. The, the county commissioner, I went into his office and like basically pleaded and was like, look, man, this is my second deal ever. And I, I obviously like, there's no money in the deal if I, if I have to pay these liens. He's like, you know what, sir, if you, uh, if you clean this house up, like you said, you're gonna, I will erase all of these liens. This house has been on my books for like eight years and I don't want to think about it again. So if you can do it. <laughs> And sure enough, you know, three months later, I did it. And then the news came back, did a news story on the completed project and it turned out to be this huge blessing in disguise. Um, and so it was just like, so the tax deed thing and then with the flip again. And so that kind of got me really interested in, in the whole flipping process. That's a very cool story because not bragging on yourself, but I can say what percentage of people would be meeting that guy at the building department and having him say that? Yeah, who knows? Well, yeah, we both know it's almost <laughs> non-existent. But 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 that's what separates successful people. I mean, almost every transaction when I was dealing directly with people, what are the odds of this happening? It seemed it seemed small. It it but yet if you're if you know you can do it, you're always in that mindset, you're finding you're gonna find a, a path. That's basically how when I talk to people directly. I'm, I'm trying to understand why they might make this decision and why that's in their best interest. So your mind is going a, mind, a mile a minute in a way while you're paying attention to them, trying to understand, you know, how do we make, how do we make this work? But that's a, that's a cool story. Were you entrepreneurial at all when you were a kid? 
you know, I didn't have this overwhelming entrepreneurial spirit. Um, I, I can't say that I like went to school and sold gum to people for tens right. But exactly. I, I, I didn't do that. So I can't okay. claim that, but I've always been open to it. And I've always been uh, of the mindset that I, I don't really want to go to work for someone else. And I didn't like doing that, um, especially even at a young age, early 20s. So I always knew there was something out there that could that, that could allow me the freedom that that I like. OK, so we've covered the got the duplex and the and the house that's totally wrecked in another state. <laughs> <laughs> so would you say that you you're not risk adverse? Is that or you calculate? You know, sometimes your experience that says, OK, I'm going to I still will take risks, but I'm going to calculate them much more. Yeah. And I think uh, the older I get and the more mistakes that I've made along the way, uh, I get a little bit more risk averse than I was earlier on. And I, I think that's probably natural. Um, but now it's, you know, uh, after, you know, being part of groups and listening to guys like you and Reggie and Cantu and all these guys that have been around the business for decades speak, you know, things resonate with you. And for me, one of them was I'd rather regret the deal I didn't do than the one I did. And I, I definitely have regretted some deals I've done. And so now I really try to look through that lens before I sign any, any uh, purchase agreement or grant deed. So when you got into the world of real estate, it was REO heaven. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and that's a good point. I haven't been in this long game long enough, uh, you know, 11, 12 years now uh, to really feel the pain of, of a major market shift. And I try to be uh, cognizant of that in my decision making and not get too, you know, willy nilly in my acquisitions, because I know that there, there is the other side of that coin that I've never, I've never seen. Well, the, the other side of the coin that I was actually going to get to was not, not the change of a, you know, into a down market, but the change of who you talk to. So you came into an REO world and probably in a very short period of time, that world dissipated and you were finding, you had to find other way to find deals. Absolutely. It's a great point. You know, it, it, that shifts. And I, you know, uh, I feel like that is always going to shift um, from here on out. It, there's, there's different ways that the deal sources will, will be coming your direction. And I think that's part of the fun is, you know, shifting with the market forces and the ones that are, that are more nimble, I think are the ones that come out on top time and time again. When you when we left the availability, easy availability of REOs, let's say 2013, probably started to you know head in the other direction. What did you do to source deals after the REOs and the short sales started right up? So I took an interesting course. So I started out on that investment side, and then uh, what I haven't mentioned is that after that, I actually got into mobile home parks and um, purchased a few parks around the country. Um, and got my feet wet doing that and really was, was on the front lines of swinging hammers and dealing with septic tanks and really doing all the dirty work that, you know, is good to do when you're young, you learn how to do it. And uh, at least moving forward, it gives you an infrastructure for hiring others to do it. But so there was a time where I wasn't really in the whole uh, single family acquisition mode with, you know, uh, with REO managers and, um, and, you know, big banks and, and uh, agents who control a lot of this, this, uh, this inventory. And then uh, when I came back to San Diego, I actually um, started also growing my, my agent business. It wasn't until about 2013 in San Diego when I really got real back heavy into the, um, you know, into, into the acquisition mode on the single family side. And there were still quite a few uh, REO managers out there and agents at that time that, that still controlled a lot of that inventory. Um, and, you know, I, I ended up working with some other successful investors who were showing me the way and uh, they had to be really creative even at that time uh, to, to get properties. Now, fast forward a little, a few years after that, um, I really employed a lot of the stuff I've learned from a lot of the guys we know, like I started doing direct mail and I've got some of the best properties I know of, um, you know, by that approach. And I still own some of them that have been some of the best the best deals that I've ever done. Um, I, I learned from Bill Cook about door knocking and did, did some great flips door knocking actually in a suburb here in San Diego and have got multiple houses that way. So I started to in integrate the seller, direct seller stuff. Um, but I will say 
you know, what some of the research I did before coming on the show today was reaching out to a lot of my friends here in San Diego. A lot of them are doing a lot of volume. I mean, we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of house flips every year. And I think the, it comes back to the largest deal source right now on everyone's plate is still real estate agents. They are still the ones that control most of the inventory These and agents. Um, everybody knows real estate agents like quick deals. They like cash buyers and they like easy and they like repeat business. And if you can be that source for them, well, then they keep coming back. And, um, you know, it's uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but you got to think of all of all the, the transactions every year, how, you know, a, a vast majority, you know, I've just guessed 90 plus percent of them are done with the, using a real estate agent. Oh, absolutely. But a vast, vast majority of them are going to get bought by owner occupants. So it's like if you have 100 agents, what percentage of the agents you think are are open to? I, I'm going to consider the investor the go to client. Um, well, if we're talking about a fixer property, well, you know, which is what we buy, then I think the propensity to, to go with an investor would be much higher than if we're talking about some turnkey. But, um, you know, I, I feel like what I've been seeing lately is a lot of agents and their clients will say, Hey, let's, let's get a few offers from some of the investors you trust and then see how we feel about it before we go to market. So you're at least getting the opportunity, but maybe it doesn't necessarily make it. And, Honestly, like I, I'm straightforward with, with agents and sellers these days. And I say, look, the market, the market dynamics are in your favor. If, if you put this on the MLS, I'm sure you'll probably end up getting more money. You'll probably get more offers, but that's not what I'm able to offer you. I'm able to offer you ease of, of, of doing this transaction and you, a done deal, et cetera. You know how, how the spiel goes. Um, and, you know, I, I, again, going back to what Cantu would say, you know, sellers will never give you equity, but they will trade it for something. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I talked with Mike Cantu. I just called him out of the blue. And I felt like I had a seminar in 15 minutes. That's so amazing. I love when that <laughs> happens. It's so true. <laughs> I mean, I can't remember the last time I flipped over. I didn't have any notes. I, would, I just had a piece of paper. He kept on coming up with gems. I went, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've known this guy for years. You know what's funny? I don't know if you know this story, but uh, he did not like speaking in public. That was not his thing at all. And um, he was a, a student of all the people that did very well in Florida. And one of them asked him to, you know, share with the audience. And he calls me up and he's just, oh, Bruce, I, I would pay you five grand to take my place. <laughs> he, he was, so we went, we had lunch and he had written out his talk word for word. I said, oh, Mike, I said, you can't, you can't do it that way. You don't need to. There's nothing in the business you don't know. I said, you're so full of stories, funny stories that teach lessons. Tell a story, open up with a story that you don't have to look at a note. And he calls me after, a, you know, he had about an hour talk, calls me up. He says, oh my God, now I know why you do this. He got a standing ovation. It was so cool. Oh, wow. That's cool. I'm sure he's got a lot more of those since then. Well, he's still, I don't think it's on his top priority list to do, this, do the teaching, but I would have to say, Per minute, there's more gems that drop out of his head. We we go to lunch once in a blue moon now, but we used to do it kind of regularly. And um, I asked him one day a question, and he said uh, he said he'd think about the answer. I said, "What's what's the one priority priority in your day that will not you will not break?" And uh, he said, oh, "Let me talk to you. Let me think about it. I'll talk to you tomorrow." So he called me up. He says, "It's reading." So this guy has studied this industry over an hour a day for 40 years. I mean, that's, that's a pretty tough mountain to, to climb or to, or to, you know, it's just like, yeah, I think I'll ask Mike. That's a good idea. Like, is there anyone else that does that? I don't know. Like maybe not. Not that consistently. Right. I mean, it's so funny talking to him. He's like, yeah. He said, I had a hurt back and now for 480 days in a row, I've done this because it's on his goal list, you know? It's just like, oh my God, <laughs> I, his day seems to be very regimented, but it, it's, it's not. He's just, he just is leading the life that he wants. And he said something very interesting because he still has a big set of goals. He said, I'm more comfortable on the climb. So he doesn't calculate, okay, it's over. 
because he doesn't want the climb to be over. He enjoys it too much. He doesn't need a thing, of course. It's just that he enjoys the, the deals. And so that's just, that was a fun conversation. So, you know, that's at 35, you know, that's uh, you're in an interesting, an interesting place, you know, with, uh, with an amazing future, but you've done it from a di very different point of view. Very few of us were realtors in any sense. In other words, we, we just were, I have a real estate license because I have a loan business. I didn't pursue clients to list properties. Now, is that something that you, you have done that, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Dead, right. at, a, at a high level. And um, I'm really glad I did. And I, I still do. Um, but it, it's, it's definitely not my main focus. And, you know, like I said earlier, it's, uh, I think what I've learned in that has helped me in the investment world. Cause like I was saying, we, 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 you get a lot of deals from agents. So if you think like one and know how the rest of us think, well, you can, you can structure your, your deals, your offers, et cetera, to, um, to be easy, easily acceptable. And, and you know how to like, not, not play any games and you just, you just know how to do what other agents want. And, um, and you meet a lot of people. So I think that's the other thing I didn't mention is that, you know, I can't tell you how many deals we've done with agents that have been in the different offices of brokerages that I've been at just simply by, by mingling and them getting to know you as the investor in the office. And it's, it's just been incredible. Well, reputation too. You've got a great reputation, so uh, I love that when it when it, something pops up and said, you know, okay, we got to call Derek. I mean, that's just you've earned that right because they want it. They've already pre-thought out what's the easiest path to a commission check and the in an easy transaction. If your name pops up in the first list on the first page and at the top of the list, they don't need ten of those, right? They need one. That's right, absolutely. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. What percentage of your deals do you think come from mailers versus the uh, agent world? Lately, probably less than 10%. Of the ma mailers, okay. Yeah, absolutely. And they're taking longer to, uh, to facilitate. And granted, I will say when you do, when you do get one, you're, it seems like the returns on the margins are, are fatter than what we're getting from agents. And, uh, and they're a little more fun and they're sometimes have a little more hair on them and you have to get a little more creative, but, um, it's, it's, it's not, it's not nearly as much as, as it even was maybe a couple of years ago. Do you have a process to improve your mailer? Um, I wish I had a really good one. Um, but it, it really just comes down to the data set is where we focus on, on improving the uh, like our mailers of like getting a better, getting lists, fine tuning, trying to get work, different wrinkles that other people aren't too aware of. I think there's always stuff that ways to improve that the actual letter itself and the physical component of the mailer, you know, we've looked at all kinds of different things and looked at the new uh, writing machines that do it for you with a pen. Um, done that. That. we've done that. <laughs> yeah. See, and I know a lot of people that have, and honestly, we stay pretty old fashioned with it. Um, we, uh, I have a full-time assistant and she actually has someone that she hires that comes in and it's an old, uh, retired gentleman who's disabled and he just loves handwriting. So he'll come in and he'll actually will handwrite the addresses, uh, on the envelopes and put the stamp on. And like, so they're actually really handwritten. The letters are not, they're, they're form written and, you know, we'll, we'll have a, a, a handwritten signature in there, but, um, but you know, it's working for us, Bruce, it, it has for years and it, you know, it's, uh, until it doesn't work anymore, we're not going to change it up too much. When a phone call comes in, who is receiving that call? So it used to be me, and now it's a gentleman named Drew. He's uh, uh, performing acquisitions for us, um, and he's acquisitions director. And uh, and now he answers it. And you know, after a while, initially it was the learning curve was uh, you know a little sharp because you have to learn how to speak the language, so to speak. But he's gotten pretty good at it now. Um, and so, but I used to actually really enjoy getting those phone calls and, uh, and being able to, you know, talk to someone and, you know, talk them off, off, off a ledge, so to speak, initially, they're very on guard, guarded when, when someone first calls you, at least for the most part. But when you tell them you're just a normal person, um, that, that usually goes away. Yeah. You know, I, this wasn't a technique. It was for me, I, I worked for a company at very first my first experience in real estate investing was kind of distasteful because the guy was really mistreating the owners at the end of the closing. They would never end up with what they were supposed to, even on a net offer. 
And so when I started doing the business, I started having phone calls come in from ads. And it wasn't, it wasn't a ploy. I was happy that I understood some of the business. And so they would present me with a problem. And I would say, okay. I said, if you'll tell me what your situation is, let me just give you solutions to every one of them that I know. And only one of those would be sell it to me. So, you know, why don't you just list it with a realtor? And, you know, and I found out the properties that I was ending up buying were saying no to those other things because they wanted speed or they had a, an opportunity or something like that. But it, I think in a way it built trust. Why are you telling me this? Because that doesn't include you making anything. You know, because if I were on your side of the table, that's what I would want. And it just made me it it just made me so happy to get a phone call instead of stressed out. I was like, OK, I'm either going to buy a property or I'm going to help somebody. What, that, what's wrong with that day? That feels good. Hey, Bruce, yeah. I know you got some questions for uh, for uh, Derek about the market, but but we're still talking about Derek. There's a couple of things that I, I, I want to ask if that's OK. Um, my first question is, you know, being a college baseball player, being a baseball player, um, we always talked about baseball and sports mirroring life has have lessons that you learned on the field helped you in business or in life more? Um, I think that I, you can apply them to both. And uh, I remember just getting out of college and not, not knowing exactly which direction you were, were going to go. Yeah. I had gotten into the investment world, uh, real estate world young, but you know, you look at interviewing, you're talking to people and putting a resume together. And, you know, I, at that time I had actually realized how much, um, playing college sports helped me in business and life, right? I think two main things for me, it was at least being coachable. And if, if you're able to be coachable, um, it's going to compress your timelines and, you know, there's no need to not be an ego in this business. And, uh, the minute you think, you know, it all, well, you don't, and you're in the wrong business, but, uh, it's, uh, I think that's number one. And, and really, I think, um, you know, the, the ethic and the strive to always get better has, you know, was, was really, it was really important to me. Um, and I've always wanted to be the best at, at, you know, at the game, I wasn't the best at baseball. Um, same with real estate. I always try to get better, whether that's, um, educational events or networking or, or reading or whatever it is, I always want to get better. And then, um, lastly, I think it's, it's a team, it's a team effort, right? Like if you learn how to work well with others, real, real estate is, is a team effort in general. I mean, if you just, reverse engineer a transaction, um, look how many components are, are, are there that were in that uh, transaction to get the deal done. There's just so many people involved. So, um, you know, it, those three things I think were, were really instrumental that I, I took from playing college sports. My other question has to do with the demographic in San Diego. Um, I know that being as close to the border is there's a lot of, you know, folks that live in Mexico come and work or vice versa. Um, when I was doing insurance, the San Diego uh, insurance offices, we used to call them Tijuana North instead of San Diego <laughs> South, things like that. How much of the transactions that you're, you're part of come from, um, like, let's say the Latino network or folks that are, you know, coming from or, or working back and forth? And when it comes to deal flow, uh, I don't think I have a, a good answer on that. But I can tell you uh, wholeheartedly that when the borders are shut down, like uh, flashback uh, to covid when we had a uh, border shut down and it's been shut down between, uh, uh, off and on here and here and then between, uh, between March, 2020, when COVID started, it, it was really hard to get labor and we would have renovation crews that would just not be there. And there's nothing you can do. And our foreman would say, Hey, I'm, I'm sorry. My guys are stuck at the border behind the border. They can't get back in. And San Diego, obviously our proximity to, to our southern border here, a lot of a lot of labor comes from across the border, and you'd be surprised as to how many people travel daily between Mexico and San Diego to come to work. And I didn't really know, uh, I didn't understand how how big it really was until it started to affect me, and I wouldn't have guys showing up on job sites. We never think about those things, you know. Um, yeah, there's just a general labor shortage, but you're like in the middle of where it's. I mean, so accessible and, and very, very real. And once that happens, you start reaching out to your networks and seeing how, how other people are affected and, and everyone felt the squeeze. Like it, it really does congest, um, you know, the, uh, the ability to, to, to get quality guys on site. And then now you're, 
you're pulling guys in you know, tile guys to do drywall or, you know, something like that. And it's not nearly as good as it should be because that's not their trade. And we had to do that for a little bit. And it, um, you know, some of the quality of the projects would show and you spend more time and money at the end, fixing all this stuff. Did you guys have supply issues uh, for, I mean, I've been building new homes basically out here. So we definitely had supplies uh, change price tough to get on the rehab side. You know, you're dealing with, Mostly, if mostly it's there already, but how did that impact the business? Absolutely, and it's right now. It's still very difficult to get appliances, and and I've had calls with a lot of the 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 big house flippers in town lately, and everyone is like, "Hey, who's your appliance guy? Who do you know? Like, how are you getting these?" And where you know, it, it's musical chairs uh, on every house to see where you can get them. Um, and so my assistant now spends a lot of time. Uh, trying to line things up beforehand before before we even need them we've had store appliances at at properties and safer neighborhoods to deliver to ones that are less <laughs> safe later just you know just to have them because you don't know if you're going to be able to get them uh lumber obviously went up and then it's it's kind of it's kind of gone back down quite a bit since then correct yeah um so i was having this conversation with one of my contractors just two days ago um we were looking at a framing budget of one of the renovations and we're like man if this framing budget was, if we just would have budgeted this today and bought the lumber today, we would have like a 25% lower budget for framing on this house or whatever it was and a big deck we were building for this one house. And um, it, it's amazing how, how volatile that was and how the supply chain issues really disrupted, um, you know, so a lot of progress here in San Diego, but that, and then labor too, um, uh, talking to a, a friend that runs a very high volume uh, shop here in town yesterday he uh, he was we, we were laughing about about renovation costs and how we we haven't been able to sniff the same pricing we were getting even a year ago today. And it's uh, so labor and materials both have gone up and, you know, it's compressing margins. And so, you know, either A, we got to buy for less or B, sell for more. Um, and, you know, uh, so it, it's it's made us re reevaluate how we underwrite. See iSurvivedRealEstate.com for event details, information on all our generous sponsors, and to connect with our speakers. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab.